Good morning. My guest today is Clara Ana Rosa. That's what I'm going to call her because that's the name that comes most easy to my Western tongue. But Clara Ana Rosa actually has got three different names that she's working under. The one is Polish, the one is Shona, and uh, um, then there is Clara Ana Rosa. I'm going to ask her about that in a moment. I'm going to ask her to introduce herself. But, but briefly, the re one of the reasons why we're talking to her today is that she has a very special animated movie called Zara or Hunger, which will be screened at the National Arts Festival in Makanda, which is coming up shortly. I have seen it, it is absolutely amazing. And I want to ask her about that. I also want to ask her about her work in Zimbabwe and about the spiritual connection that is gonna um, play out in a big festival that she's running in Harare later this year. Clara, thank you that I'm allowed to call you Clara. Please tell us who you are and what your other names are and where all these names come from. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jack. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you for having me on this interview. And indeed, my name, I think the, the easiest is just Clara. Uh, just Clara. But um, Clara Wojtkowska is what I was born as and still, and it's a Polish name. It's, uh, it, I, I laugh because it's a very common Polish name. Like you couldn't have a more ordinary name than Wojtkowska in Poland. And then outside of Poland, uh, you know, people say, what? What is that? What does that mean? And so on. So, um, but I, I like it. Of course, I love my name, uh, Wojtkowska. It actually, um, it means, it comes from the Slavic name Wojciech or Wojtek. Uh, and Wojciech, depending on the translation, it means the warrior who brings joy or warrior of joy or the person who battles for joy or, you know, whatever it is. So that it's is a very a beautiful name, I have to say. I mean, that suits name. very much from what I've read and seen from you. That sounds very much like the name was chosen for you by the stars. Yeah, you know, it's uh, names are very special things. So, uh, but at some point, you know, especially uh, there was a point uh, when Zara was, when it was shut down, when there was a drama around that here, and uh, people started calling me Wachkoka uh, here. And Wachkoka in Shona means uh, the one who is broken. And I was like, no, 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 no. This, this, is, not, uh, this is not working for me, you know. Plus, I need a, I've, I've felt for a long time, I need a, a stage name, you know, something that is lighter on the tongue, maybe slightly lighter on the spirit, uh, you know, and you can't be, War, warrioring your whole life. So um, at some point, I uh, I adopted Clara Ana Rosa, which Ana Rosa was my grandmother from my mom's side. Um, she was Anna Rosa. She was Polish, but she was a Spanish translator. She was very, very, very close to Mexico. Actually, the last two weeks of her life before she died, she only spoke Spanish. So everyone knew her as Ana Rosa. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I don't know, I started feeling kind of more closer to her and her journey and I said okay let me try Clara Ana Rosa I like the rhythm of it I like the feel I like the energy let me try um, so that's what I go by on stage now and then there is Masibanda or Shumba um, which is my Shona totem Masibanda is actually in Debele but it's it's um it's from Shumba, meaning it's lion, it's the lion totem, and it's the totem that adopted me in Zimbabwe. So depending on how you feel about totemism and how you feel about totems, um, you know, for me, it is a, a deep, to be adopted spiritually is a very deep and significant thing, and I don't take it lightly. Um, it's uh, so... So it feels like it's a way also to to connect and to be connected here. Um, and I don't know how much you know about the totem system, and uh, but it is a it's a very beautiful thing because besides the ecological implications of being somehow co-responsible for whether it's an animal, whether it's a, a, a body part, whether it's a uh, something in the world that you are also responsible for protecting and that is responsible for protecting you. 
there's also the aspect of um, connecting to other people because all of these totems are also related to each other mythologically, family-wise, story-wise. So when you meet somebody, you know, when I meet somebody, they might say, ah, you know, so if my husband is Shumba, then you are actually, you know, this relation to me. Or if my daughter is Shumba, I am actually your mother. And so it's a way of constantly looking for a relationship, which is one of the things about most African cultures that I know that I really love. It's that in everything, when you meet something, somebody, you're trying to think, how am I related to you? Rather than how am I separated from you? Or how am I different from you? How, you know, it's... Um, yeah, so it's a way of building family relationship and so on, which is what names do also. I thought I just need to ask you something. You talk about here. Where is here? Where are you talking to me at the moment? I know you're in Zimbabwe, oh. but where is here? Yes. Are you in Bulawayo? Are you in Harare? Where are you now? Yeah, I'm in Harare. I'm in Harare. I'm across the street from the University of Zimbabwe, which is where I work and live at the moment. And, and the reason why you are there is uh, you won a Fulbright scholarship to study at the University of Harare. But uh, you've been in Zimbabwe for much longer than the actual scholarship. Why, what, what, what took you there in the first place? Why Harare? And, and why did you stay? Why have you been adopted there? Because that's what you've now said. <laughs> you've been adopted spiritually into, um, you speak Shona, you put a Shona name. The Mandoro, we'll speak about the Mandoro as a very important part of, of uh, Zimbabwean background now. But, but what brought you, what called you to Zimbabwe in the first place? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, the, you know, it's a, because it's the story of my life, I find it to be quite ordinary. Uh, so I don't say any of this, uh, you know, as a, anything like, um, I mean, it is what it is. But I, I actually landed in Zimbabwe for the first time. It was sort of an accident. Um, I was in South Africa after I graduated from music school. I was in South Africa on a grant. I was actually uh, meeting. My, my aim was to research the Polish diaspora in South Africa, of which I knew there were a lot of Polish people there. I knew nothing else. I landed in South Africa and got very interested in other things, mainly uh, African music and South African jazz and uh, all kinds of, you know, just all kinds of other adventures. And at the time it was uh, 2010, 2009, 2010, there, I met a lot of Zimbabweans and they were telling me how awful things were in Zimbabwe. And I got very curious. And so I boarded a bus for a few days and actually took a bus to Bulawayo. Um, and uh, something about that journey, even though it was only a few days, something about it changed my life. Uh, because you could say since that time, even though I didn't actually make the decision to move to Zimbabwe until 2017, 2017 was when I said, okay, I'm moving to Zimbabwe. I think the decision came in 2016, but I didn't get on a plane until 2017. Um, but until that time, I've been somehow in relationship to Zimbabwe, whether it's trying to not come back, whether it's thinking about coming back, whether it's trying to understand what it is that uh, that called me here. But uh, what happened in 20, maybe around 2015, 2014, 2015, um, 2015, yeah, was a, I, I had given up on understanding I had given up on the project, uh, the relationship with Zimbabwe, and I got very sick. Um, I had this whole like fire through my body. I had a lot of crazy dreams, and uh, and I met uh, Maladoma Somme at the time, um, and I, you know, I I suddenly I went on this journey of getting prepared for going to the place that actually is in some ways my home and to to make a concerted thinking decision that so healed me because the healing that i needed and that uh, you know the, the 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 process of initiation that i went through was very i mean i call it very african in that it's a very traditional like most African healers go through that, you know, because you're out of alignment with the ancestor and so on. You have to fix things. The spirit has to be born. All of those things. I had to go through all of those things. Um, and I had to do them here. 
So there's some connection that I have here. And I'm now uh, trying in my life to respect that and to serve that um, and to, to do that in a good in a good and healthy way. I'm going to ask you about the traditional healers because that's very much part of Sansara, the movie. Uh, but what you have described is very much like the calling that many traditional healers of Australia in South Africa have exactly expressed. It's very interesting. Um, you are talking about healing. Uh, now let's let's get onto the movie because that's that is it's a it's a beautiful movie. It, as I say, it will be screened at the National Arts Festival. For those who are interested, I will um, once this is broadcast, I will put the link underneath um, this broadcast so people can actually click on it and book for it. As I understand, uh, Clara, it will be it will be screened. Um, it will be downloadable for a short period, so people can actually watch it anywhere in South Africa, maybe even in Zimbabwe, if I'm correct. Is that correct? I think so. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't absolutely. See, in yeah. fact, it might be worldwide. I, I I need to double check that with the festival organizers. Mm -hmm. But but it, it's it's uh, it's you don't have to physically physically be in Makanda to see the movie. It will be it will be screened. Um, it will be streamed. Um, Zara, it's 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 a uh, it's about dreams. It's about uh, visions. It's about spirituality. It's about the stars. It's about being aligned. Things that you're talking about now. In brief, um, if I if I may summarize it, and then you can tell me whether I'm too Western in my thinking. <laughs> the summary would be that there's a big hunger in the land, but the hunger I see it is in some ways it is it is a true hunger. It's a physical hunger, which is something which Zimbabwe has gone through. But there's also a spiritual hunger, and the physical hunger drives people to not respect the spirituality. They look at the moon and they see a big round plate and they want to eat the plate they want to eat from the moon but in the moon or well, the moon itself is actually represented by a beautiful woman who enchants the king who the king is in love with a with a woman from the moon but he wants to own her he doesn't just want to love her um, and so am I correct up to this point I don't want to give too much away but I think you know that that sort of sets the scene do 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 you know <laughs> Yeah, um, it does. Okay. <laughs> no, that's brilliant. That's beautiful. For a non-linear movie, you've done really well. <laughs> and then, but then, I, without going too much, I just want to say there is then the, the thing that strikes me right at the beginning of the movie, because I think let's start there, is that people go to the place which looks like Great Zimbabwe. There are a number of shrines like that in Zimbabwe, of course, but to the to people from outside, Great Zimbabwe is probably the best known. And they want to go and pray there. But what is so interesting then is that the security guards, who are very much, you know, the typical straight-jacketed Western security guards, then start chasing people away and saying, no, but you know that you don't pray correctly. You don't pray spiritually the way you should. We should ban these people who pray differently from us. Who are we? Who are us? And that is so interesting because you've just mentioned that in Africa, so much of healing is when you start looking for the connectivity between people and not the separation between people. Was that a, was that, how did that come about? That, that's, before we get into the love story and the stars, where did that, that separation anxiety, if I, could, I mean, I'm using the term very, very tongue in the cheek now, but where did that come from? Why did you put that so strongly, so poignantly in your movie? Uh, yeah, well, it's, um, it's a very multi layered issue. So it depends on, again, your perspective, and people have read that in many ways. Uh, one of them is, you could say, the most straightforward in Zimbabwe, which is um, that there's a real conflict between uh, Christianity and traditionalism. Um, I should say there's a real conflict on the outside. On the outside, you have, you know, people calling each other demons and other people calling each other demons and whatever else. And you know, these are, I mean, it's a very, um, I see it as a post-colonial issue, um, uh, but it's based on a real understanding that there are things in the spirit world that we are afraid of, that we have a healthy, I don't know, 
healthy respect for. And that unless you are, let's say, dragged into that world, because that is the healer's call in a way, um, then, you know, most people do well to, to stay away from, from those things, uh, right? In some way. And, uh, and then, uh, and then there's the, then there's the, another layer, or I would think of it as a deeper layer, which is also the sense of how divided is a society or a world, let's say, where I don't trust that you are praying for good things for me. And that gets at the issue of witchcraft. That gets at the issue, you know, of, as much as, you know, we talk a lot about witchcraft and people say, ah, you know, they do this, they do that, they do so on. On some level, um, if I may say, many people know that the worst things that are done to you in that realm are by people who know you. Meaning the worst betrayals, if we want to put it colloquially, uh, the worst betrayals are from people who you are close to, who you know you love, who loved you, whatever. You know? And so that sense of how hurt are we as people? Um, how much are we divided and how can we rebuild our community if I don't trust your prayers? I don't trust what it is that you are talking to the spirit about. Um, it's like paranoia to the nth degree. You know? um, so that, in a sense, is the first thing that comes out for healing. Um, and of course, then there's the other thing. You know, there's another another layer to it, which just has to do with the fact that we have a lot of sacred places around the world. We have a lot of Zimbabwe. Of course, it's a place of shrines, uh, but it is not the only place of shrines in the in the whole world. Um, the earth, in a way, is a conglomeration of sacred places. And how strange is it that our culture, I don't know what you want to call it, I don't even really call it Western culture anymore, I call it some the, the overculture or something, you know, the, the dominant culture, the dominant way of thinking, thinks it's very normal to go to a place, you know, maybe buy a candy there, drink some beer there, take some pictures and so on. But not to go and pray there. To go and pray at the sacred places around the world is seen as a strange thing because we are meant to be tourists. We are meant to, you know, um, and if you go to Great Zimbabwe, you see that. Um, you are supposed to behave like a tourist there. If you go to Egypt, it's the same thing. You have to behave like a tourist. If you do things that are not touristy, uh, you are under suspicion. So what have we created in the mind? What kind of sicknesses have we created? mind that it is so you know that's my perspective interesting because one of the things that that i picked up um in doing research around Zara is also that that you yourself um, have become quite interested in kind of the alignment of things like the pyramids and zimbabwe and how all of those in the end tap into a much deeper spirituality alignment with the stars even um, it, it's uh, um, it, one of the one of the things that is interesting if one watches Zara is is how the stars are actually um, how, how the mandoro the white line becomes part of the star sign part of the heavens part of the ancestral background um, which in the end would you know one, one you know sh that connectedness once the connectedness happens healing can start happening. Um, but, but how did your journey into I'm trying to understand this happen? I mean, you know, because as I say, it's, it sounds to me, it sounds a little bit like we use the word a shaman, which of course is not Western, but I mean, it is, you know, a lot of people think of a traditional healer. In South Africa, some people still call them witch doctors, which of course is completely wrong. Uh, but the whole idea of a traditional healer is exactly to bring to start aligning, and and you, in some ways, you're on a journey like that, and it, it shows through your movies and through through your work, and even your your stage work, um, which I'll talk about in a short while. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, which aspect do you want me to? No, I'm just I'm just thinking. You know the. Uh, it's basically, uh, if we look up to the stars, you see a lot of thousand splendid suns, um, you know, I can call it that. Uh, but also, you know, the stars have always had meaning far beyond merely just nebulae of gas. Um, 
and uh, um, in the mythologies, the moon in, in the moon is especially powerful in Zara. Um, but then so are the you know the mandora. What the mandora maybe the mandora? I think that's maybe. Let's talk about that. That's something that the majority of Western people, white people, even I think even Af black African people outside Zimbabwe would not be aware of. Why is the mandora, the white lion, so important to to the Zimbabwean people? Yeah, so uh, that's a that's a good question, and and I'll answer from from my perspective. Uh, I'm sure there are many people who would answer differently. Um, so first of all, Mondoro uh, is a it's a Shona word, um, and it just literally means lion. So it's not actually a white lion. Um, the white okay. lions of Timbavati and so on. That's a, a that is a mythology that is connected with the Mondoro mythology, okay. and also okay. Mondoro again. It just literally means. So you can just see a lion, you'll call it a Mondoro. Mondoro. Okay, okay. It's, yeah, um, yeah. you know, Shumba, Mondoro, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But the other thing is Mondoro is also, it's a, you know, one of the things I love about Shona is just how multi-layered the words are. Um, that's why there is the potential also for so much repetition, even if you look at song lyrics and so on, because the layers go so, 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 so deep. Um, and the word Mondoro is one of them. Um, it also means king. And it also means, um, it, it, it's also the spirit of the king or chief that comes back into the body of a lion or into, or in the form of a lion. Um, but there's also the understanding that in some ways, uh, the ancestral realm is located somewhere up there. Um, and that the journey of the soul in general is a journey of from up there to here, from here to up there. Um, and that the return of the ancestor is um, it's a blessing for all of the people because the ancestors are the ones who hold the space for humanity. Um, so the return of the great ancestor, the Mondoro, um, the Mondoros are, they are known here to be the, the spirits who are, well, they're very good spirits. And that's one thing to really emphasize. Um, uh, I liked, uh, there's one guy, I liked the way he put it, which was, he said, you know, the spirit world, it's so vast. It's so vast. You can never know everything. No, no one human being, not even a group of people, they will never know everything about this. It's so complex. However, there's one thing we know for sure. We know how to tell a good spirit from a bad spirit. And how do you do that? A good spirit always thinks about more than just themselves. Always. Um, and that is the, the, the definition of the mundo. They think about the whole. They think about the, the, the nation. They think about the land. They're the, the protectors of the land. Um, they're environmentalists. They think about the balance of, of life. And they, um, they protect their, their holders of a, of a greater vision, of a greater vision of community and connection. Um, it, and it's a very beautiful, I mean, to me, the Mondoros, they're, they're very much, they're full of that kind of bigger love. You know? And um, and their coming down is a form of, well, it's a form of sacrifice. Um, as, as, of course, is the woman in the moon um, who comes down to love. But, but I, I just want to briefly mention something uh, because your you said something earlier. Your movie is not non is non linear, and that the storytelling is non linear. The songs are circular. Now I lived in in Venda for a long time, which is on the border of Zimbabwe, and I got to know some of the storytelling, the way in which repetition, repetition, repetition. And I think that's important when people watch your movies to understand all the layers and all the repetition because you hear the same phrase over and over and over and over and over again. And slowly but surely it sort of, it, but it morphs. It doesn't always stay the same. You've got to be so careful and listen out for it. Um, how, how did you start making this movie? I mean, this is, this is an animated movie. And maybe just in small ways, I mean, Shumba, we, of course, in, um, in the West, you know, there was Simba, the lion, Shumba. That's the same root, of course. 
Um, and of course, we have, you know, Sumba is a, is a very powerful, well-known figure in South Africa. So that's, you know, it's, it's similar. But how did you actually start making this movie? Because it must have been a long, how did, long did it take? I mean, it's a long movie and the animation takes a long time. And there's, you know, so on the one hand, just the animation. And then, of course, we need to start talking about the music because you're actually a musician and you're in your, in your movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so the the movie was one of those, um, it was a product of the, the corona pandemic, um, okay. which I'm very, I'm very pleased about. What happened was uh, we had a theater premiere at the end of 2019 in Harare, uh, and then we got a, um, a grant from Pro Helvet at Johannesburg to take the play to South Africa. Uh, and uh, then Corona started. And so we were waiting and waiting and waiting. And at some point it became clear that in 2020, nobody was going to South Africa. <laughs> uh, and so the Pro Helvet said, okay, well, you can use the money. Um, you know, propose something else because we have to spend the money because we are on these, you know, you know how these NGOs or whatever organization they have to. Well, Helvetia, but so just well. by the way, for those who don't know, it's the Swiss organization that funds the arts. So just, yes, yes. Yeah. So sorry, continue. Yeah. 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 No, no, it's okay. So, um, so at that point, uh, I was very inspired by Miyazaki movies uh, in 2020. I was. You know, I had watched Spirited Away, Princess Mononoke, and I was very, very, very inspired by the fact that when the shutdown, the first shutdowns happened, I was in Poland. Um, and, you know, and people were watching Netflix. And it was like people's movie tastes changed from day to day. You know, I, the one day they were watching all of the, I don't know, the normal, whatever it was, actions, romance, whatever else. And then suddenly the pandemic hit the world was locked down and suddenly everybody was watching animated Japanese cartoons about the love of nature. And I thought, wow, you know, that goes to show you when the end of the world happens, nobody wants to hear about these violent movies or this cheap, whatever it is. Everyone wants to see beautiful things. That's actually what our souls desire. And I thought, um, and I started, you know, having dreams. Also, usually I have, I'll have intuitions, I'll have dreams, be like, ah, oh, what directions to take this in? Because I wasn't quite completely happy with Nzada as a theater play. Um, I had later done it as a monodrama. I had done it as all these things. I like the text. I like the music. I like speaking it. There was part of me that said, how do you actually create a magical world? Um, how do you actually do that? You know, the theater has its limitations. Um, it's, yeah. And uh, so then I talked to my friend in Poland and she's, you know, I said, I want to make an animation out of this. And so on. she said, how much time do we have? I said, three months. She thought it was 20 minutes. It turned out it's an hour and a half. Um, and somehow, miraculously, it came out. Somehow, you know, somehow. Uh, we had no idea how it was going to come out. Um, but then we ended up being uh, invited to showcase at uh, Poland's basically most prestigious film festival. And that was our big, that was our big su success with Zada. That was the feeling that it was somehow seen or heard, you know, and that somehow, somehow really uh, accepted for what it, for what it is. So that was the, the story of making it. You, you did use Shona uh, actors in your movie uh, for voiceovers. Um, how, how do people in Zimbabwe see it? How do they relate to it? How did they relate to Zara? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's a good question. Um, you know, the, the issue with Zara was um, we initially, uh, the play, the theater play was actually shut down. Yes. So we only yes. performed once. Okay. <laughs> In Zimbabwe. Who shut it down? Let's just start there. Who shut it down? Uh, law and order. <laughs> okay, sure. Yes, okay. Yeah. I can, yeah, I can imagine because, I mean, that, that opening scene did raise questions, but okay, continue. Did please. it? Okay. Yeah, yes, no, that, yes. That's good to, that's good to know. <laughs> you know, I was very, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, these things happen, right? These things happen. You're a person in the world. People, people do things. People do things. Um, so, so that first premiere, though, we 
Uh, people like the people who have encountered Zara in Zimbabwe. People like Zara. Um, in fact, a lot of people really like Zara. Um, the problem was the shutdown. So, so I'm working on doing a Zimbabwean premiere of the movie in July. I understand. In um, but the big, but, the big uh, king is no more. I mean, the big king who wanted to eat the moon is no more. Or do you think maybe you should not answer this question? <laughs> you are in Zimbabwe still. <laughs> okay, let's let's not go there. I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna ask this question of you. Um, no, no, let's not go there. Um, I want to talk about music. Let's talk about the music because there's lovely violin music in there. There's the mbira. There's the uh, the kora. Um, uh, you you yourself actually. I mean, I think you studied music as as your first degree am i correct you're a musician you play the violin and the, i mean the violin in here is just absolutely beautiful oh thank you thank you i really appreciate that yeah violin was where i started um and in a way where i will end uh I, it feels like it's the the the, the theme uh you know i'm a as much as I do all of these other things, they center around music, which uh, I, I would agree with the people who say that music is the highest art. Um, there's something so fundamentally connecting about it. And when you start doing ceremony music as well and playing in ceremony, you understand that the music opens the doors to all of the worlds. Um, and for me, violin, um, I've been on a long journey with violin. So even though I was trained as a classical violinist and um, that was my trajectory for a time uh, before I went to South Africa. <laughs> I, it, I, I was also looking for ways, I, I felt very limited within the classical mentality or the classical structure. And it always felt to me like somehow the violin was being underserved. Like it had, it was a deeply connecting, wild spiritual instrument that was being boxed into this it's one way of thinking, you know. We we know one person who wrote good music, Beethoven. Everybody else is just, you know, after that well, it was just a uh, hack. I think so I think, Pag I think Paganini was a bit of a wild spirit himself, you know. Well, that's exactly it. That's that's I mean, what I'm Paganini saying, was was, was uh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of spirituality um, and wildness. Um, even um, a term that that you know the the the. Uh, I mean, I, there's a lot of I mean, a lot of Paganini's music draws from from the the, the, the travelers in in Europe. Um, you know, the, the yeah. traveling nations, the the ones who are not connected to borders, the Roma. Um, I yeah, mean, that's that's where a lot of the Paganini uh, music comes from, and we forget that when we listen to to people playing it in, in bow ties on stage, just you know, the way exactly. it um, yeah. You though, you you bring it it back you bring it into the african content there's a lot of um, dissonance there's a lot of um screeching even there's a lot of i mean you 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 play the violin differently nowadays am i correct in fact you you talk about ceremony music please explain to me what you mean by ceremony music and then ceremony theater because zara started the ceremony theater it's a term that i'm not familiar with what do you what do you mean by that yeah, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a life project I've been working on for a long time. Um, so it started, in terms of ceremony music, it started with, uh, well, you know, there was a point where I got to, I was very burned out as a, as a violinist, as a musician. I felt like I had looked in other places in other ways. You know, I had played as a club violinist and so on. I'd done a lot of this jamming or whatever it is you want to call it, improvising. But I felt completely like I, I still didn't manage to find the space for what it is that I wanted to express. And then I started playing in plant ceremonies. I started uh, working in plant ceremonies. I started playing in plant ceremonies. This was in, um, in Arizona and Mexico. Uh, and this was, uh, and it was suddenly like I found, I found the place for, for my voice or for my music or for, even for the violin. Like it suddenly made sense. Um, and that was really where, uh, you know, and then playing even in ceremonies this side, which I only started playing violin in traditional ceremonies here this year, when finally I just said, I'm just bringing the violin. I'm no longer going to try to explain or ask or whatever. I'm just bringing the violin. 
And when I play, when I pull out the violin and play, everything makes sense. So again, there's this element of not trying to explain. You can't explain things. You actually just have to do them. And then they either make sense or they don't. Um, so, so that was, um, you know, and, and starting to work in ceremony, starting to enter the ceremony space. And I do, I work with the word ceremony. I know in the English language, people talk about ritual or ceremony. What do those words mean? Um, for me personally, I've always associated ritual with the private, private space and ceremony with the, the group ritual space. Um, so when I think about ceremony, that's why I call it ceremony theater and not ritual theater. I know some people call it ritual theater and so on. But again, I associate that more with like what people do privately and not the big celebration. Um, so ceremony theater to me, it, it began from this concept of, you know, of course, traditional concepts, but also the performance that is not just for human beings, the performance that is actually more for the spirit world. Human beings just happen to be there, more for the earth. And that actually does take advantage of, you know, first the elements and so on. Um, I've gone through a lot of different uh, versions of this because I've done a lot of plays along the lines. Usually what happens is I'm given a story. I'm given a myth. And then it's meant to come through me somehow, and it's meant to be given back to the ones who gave me the story or the myth. Usually it's in a sacred place. Usually it's the, the, the spirits of that place. You know? So so that I came from Great Zimbabwe. So it had to come back to Great Zimbabwe. We actually ended up taking it and performing it for the moon in Great Zimbabwe. It was a private performance. It was just us. But it was, um, you know, it was that gift back. So it it holds that journey to be to be at its center. Uh, and hopefully that comes out in the artistry of it. Hopefully that comes out as well. Um, but you, so you play the violin and you obviously are, I mean, it's beautiful. You also play the bira, the dupora. Um, did you play all the music yourself? Did you have help? Um, I know that you used voiceover artists for, for Zara. Um, Yes, yes. So, um, so with the music, uh, okay. So I think I think I can be. Um, I think especially with Nzara, what happened was um, I I did have you know the the actors who we performed with, who we premiered with, uh, they were in Zimbabwe, and they are actually two of them are in the movie. Um, they recorded some things, they sent it to Poland. We had trouble because some things they weren't recording very well. We couldn't use those recordings. I worked with some Zimbabweans who stay in Poland um, and they also, they recorded in Poland in the studio with me. Um, those were also the musicians that we used. Uh, in, but the songs themselves, they came from the original theater performance and they were, yeah, they, they didn't come from me. It was, it was my music for the show which um, I think, I think uh, I don't know, I, I can be very obsessive as an artist, uh, you know, as a creator. I can be very much like it has to be this way and it has to be this song and it has to be in this place. And, um, and I, I feel like that actually did serve me that, was that, that, that level of, you know, yeah. So, so the violin, mixing the violin and the bira and all of that, um, people, I'm going for the feeling of it, you know, and I know that for some people, they think about art differently. They think about time pieces and appropriateness. They would say, well, the violin didn't exist during the Roji Empire, so why do you have the violin in Zara? But that to me doesn't make sense as a way of thinking because I'm constantly operating in mythological space, mythological time, where it's the feeling of the thing from the inside rather than how does it look like from the outside. And, you know, and that's another um, aspect of the, my work as an artist. Well, I mean, movies did not exist in those times. Now we're making movies. So, I mean, yes. Um, right. You are also working on a, on a large festival, which will premiere in um, Harare later this year. And uh, you're putting together a stage play by the name of Rudu Nenyeredzi, where you're also going to play the violin, where it's, it's also going to be, you know, very much part of the, you know, connecting 
connecting very different worlds. Can you briefly want to talk about the play and about the, the festival that you it's in August, am I correct? That 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 will happen in Zimbabwe. Yeah, yeah. So I don't, you know, so we are we are working on the festival. It's called the Nyamatati Festival. Uh, Nyamatati means mean? morning star. Okay. Nyamatati means morning star, so it's the festival of the morning star. Uh, and it is a festival, it's seven days of walking through various aspects of humanity. Um, and it's a different style of festival. I think that's uh, that's what I'm. I think about it more as a mixed media festival, but also a. It has a start point and it has an end point. It is meant to be a journey of some kind of a journey of transformation, specifically through star mythologies, which in most, in many cultures, star mythologies are the ones that tell us about the origin stories of humanity. Even. There's something about our relationship to the stars that asks the question of who are we really? Um, where do we come from? What is our potential? What is our relationship to time? What is our relationship to the journey of the soul? Um, and then because we're told a lot of things about what a human being should be or could be. And in fact, again, this global overculture is very much based on the idea that human beings cannot be trusted, that humanity is sick and that uh, when left to their own devices, human beings do things that um, are terrible and awful. And war is the story of humanity. But the stars, it's very interesting because they tell us about very long spans of time, you know, much longer than the last couple thousand years. And when you go into that mythological past, the story of humanity is actually very beautiful. We are actually very, very, very beautiful and very connected to each other. Um, so the festival, through these seven days, we have seven patron stars, and then kind of at the end, ending with with Yamatsati, is um, it's a reorientation of of the human spirit. Yeah, and that's uh, that's what we are working on. So um, yeah, that's so hopefully it's interesting. I I I. I want to mention that the original Burning Man in, in America was actually also very much a spiritual festival. Is um, it? Yes. It has become quite a commercial venture. I know people don't like it when I say that, but it's interesting that the original idea of the Burning Man, the, the effigy that was burnt in the end, was actually also to, to say, but this which is worldly is less important than that which will go up. There's a deep mythological background to Burning Man, which let's not talk about that now. When when will the festival be? And, uh, um, you know, is it something that, that ordinary people from South Africa, for instance, would come and visit you and, and, you know, take part in? Yeah, hopefully. I mean, we're hoping, you know, that people will come, that they'll show up, that, uh, that they will participate. Um, so it's uh, right now, Dates we have are August 14th through the 20th. It's kind of a seven day adventure. Um, and that's what we are currently working with. And absolutely, you know, we have um, we have our Facebook page, we have our intro video, which I will send to you as well, which uh, gives a background to the, to the concept of the festival. And uh, yeah, we are definitely you know, working Super. for all kinds of connections. I think what 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 I would suggest is, uh, um, as I said, I've seen in Zara. I was I was it, it's it's fascinating. It's a uh, it's very different from, you know, one should not accept uh, or expect something from from Disney. Um, it is very much along the cyclical style of the African story tradition. The narration is very much in the cyclical style. Um, uh, this something small of which I want to just come back on before we close in the movie there's a fascinating concept about the thin um, traditional healers and the fat traditional healers you mentioned something earlier about traditional healers that that care for others and don't Do you briefly just want to explain that for people who are going to see the movie because if you don't understand the concept it kind of makes sense or no sense or does it can you just explain why that's an important concept and who the spiritual leader is that you ask as per the movie? Yeah, it's. Um, I think it's. I think it's an important thing. You know, there are some things that uh, I feel like maybe in my life also I'm. 
I sometimes say things that are very obvious to me, and and then people tell me, I, you know, I'm not supposed to say those kinds of things. But then I say them anyway because they're very obvious to me, they're clear to me somehow. Um, we have a real uh, struggle uh, around the world these days, and it's you know it's a real one for traditional healing to be recognized, to be respected, of which I am absolutely on board. Um, and there are reasons why people do not trust traditional healers, and those are not false reasons. Those are not just the reasons of you know Christianity coming and saying this is demon and so on and so forth. This has to do with the fact that there are many traditional healers all around the world that really hurt people. Yeah. Um, yeah. For you know, and of course the, the theories behind it, even the spiritual reasons behind it, there are so 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 many. Um, you know, whether it's that it's just simply you know the the spiritual healer as a or the traditional healer as a trickster figure, um, as a person who, who betrays in order for greater healing, or just the fact that traditional healing is actually about power, and that the concepts of good and bad start to mean different. Things. The further you are on the spiritual path, there are all kinds of reasons why that is. But there is also the sense that um, there is small thinking and there is big thinking. Like when we talked about the Mondoro, you know, the, the spirits that hold a vision for, okay, you know, if you come to me and you say, you know, I'm in love with this person uh, and I want them to love me back and I'll treat them really well. Uh, and I say, okay, I can make you a love potion because you'll pay me money, then I can feed my family and so on. But you're tampering with somebody's free will and you don't know what the consequences are in the long run. You don't know what the big picture is versus, you know, the, the, the spiritual discernment to be able to say, do I want to tamper with this situation here? Do I have the, the right to do so? Uh, and a lot of very bad things have been done and are continually being done in that world that, again, don't have anything to do with um, whether traditional healing itself is either bad. But, uh, so when you have the thin Mondoro and the fat Mondoro, they're both, they're both capable. You know? When people talk to me, like I guess in the Western thinking, uh, you know, a lot of people, they say, ah, traditional healing is just full of charlatans. You know, and I think to myself that if that was true, then there would be no danger in that. You know, there's no danger in a charlatan. A charlatan can only take your money and then you lose money. Okay, that's not the worst thing that can happen to you. But people who actually have power and they use their power to hurt you, that's where the real danger lies. Um, so the thin mondoro and the fat mondoro are a presentation of that and showing that both of them in a way that figure you're not it's not clear in the movie is this a thin one or a fat one is this a person who is telling the people to to tamper with the laws of nature or telling people to not tamper with the laws of nature you know and again the human being has to make those decisions and not to leave things to you know these uh spiritual auto mechanics who are always uh, fine. <laughs> that's beautiful <laughs> That's so beautiful. There's a there's a there's a scene in the movie. I don't, I'm not going to give it away, but it reminded me of the biblical story of the Tower of Babel. Um, and again, that's how all these things are interconnected, isn't it? Um, and uh, anyway, glad it's 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 been special speaking to you. Um, and uh, I I do want to encourage people to watch Zara. As I said, I'll. I'll no, here I'll put a link for people to see it as part of the National Arts Festival. And um, good luck with your with your Morning Star project. Um, I look forward to it, and maybe we can speak again closer to the time. Thank you for taking Absolutely. time to speak to us here at uh, Litnet. Ah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you.